Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Airplane Anatomy, a series where I break down different airplanes from their history to their design to how they fly. So today in episode four, we're going to be talking about an iconic bomber aircraft from World War II, and that is the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. Now, arguably, this was the single aircraft that determined the outcome of World War II in the Pacific theater. And that was because it was the bomber aircraft for the United States, as well as the airplane to eventually drop both atomic bombs. Now it might surprise you to find that the development of the B-29 actually cost three billion dollars at the time, which far exceeded the 1.9 billion it took to develop the Manhattan Project for the atomic bombs. So this actually made the B-29 the most expensive development from World War II. So was the B-29 really worth the three billion dollar price tag? And where did all that money go? Stay tuned. In the years leading up to World War II, the U.S. realized that they had a critical weakness in their fleet, and that was that they were missing a long-range bomber aircraft that could also handle heavy payloads. So the aircraft that they did have at the time, the B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-24 Liberator, both didn't have enough range to reach the Pacific. So in 1938, a year before the start of World War II, Boeing started on the development of a new long-range bomber. Now, engineers really pulled out every trick they knew from the book in order to build the B-29, as it was considered one of the most innovative bombers of its time uh, by at least a decade. So for example, the B-29 was the very first bomber to be fully pressurized. Now the bomb bays, which is the main component in the jet that contained the bombs and the ammunitions that would be open during flights, that was unpressurized. However, there was actually a tunnel that joined the pressurized cabins at the front and the rear of the aircraft so that the crew could crawl through and get from one end to the other. Now the challenge of designing a long-range bomber aircraft that could also carry heavy payloads was solved with the addition of four Wright duplex cyclone radial engines. Now these engines were extremely powerful but they were also the source of a lot of tragedies as they were notoriously unreliable and would often malfunction or even catch on fire during flights. So pilots often uh, jokingly refer to them as the wrong engines. Now during takeoff, B-29 pilots would also struggle desperately for airspeed, which is rare because normally pilots aim for altitude during takeoff. And that was because these radial engines need a constant airflow in order to keep them cool. So if the pilots fail to uh, gain airspeed as quickly as possible during takeoff, there was a very high risk of engine failure and even fire on board. The very first prototype of the B-29, at the time a variant called the XB-29, took its maiden flight on September of 1942, three years into the war. And this happened at Boeing Field, which is an airfield outside of Boeing's main factory near Seattle, Washington. It was actually at the second test flight that disaster struck, because during the flight, uh, one of the left engines actually caught on fire and burnt through the left wing spar, which is its main structure holding it up. So uh, the B-29 actually ended up crashing into a meatpacking factory about three miles outside of Boeing Field, killing all 11 crew and 18 on the ground. So it was at this point that Boeing actually said, well, we're not gonna make this plane anymore because it's no good. Uh, to which the Air Force said, well then we want our $200 million deposit back. So it was actually at the threat of having to return this money that they've already spent on the plane that Boeing continued to develop the B-29. And throughout the production of the B-29, changes in design would actually happen so quickly and so often that many times brand new planes would fly straight off the production line and into these modification factories where they were extensively rebuilt and all of these new changes would be incorporated. And many times these modification factories didn't even have the bandwidth to uh, directly tend to all of these incoming new aircrafts. So uh, this of course added to the strings of delays that the B-29 program experienced as well as its hefty price tag. Uh, however, regardless of that, actually 4,000 B-29s ended up being produced of all the variants together. So needless to say, this was still a very successful airplane. 
So at the early stages of the B-29 coming into service, the Air Force actually had a very big problem, and that was that pilots didn't want to fly the B-29. And that was because people knew that with the rush development of the B-29, it actually didn't have enough time to go through extensive testing as the previous bombers before it did. And also, it was just a notorious plane that was known for engine failures and mechanical problems, and was generally regarded as a plane that was unsafe to fly. So the man who solved this problem was by the name of Colonel Paul Tibbetts Jr. And Colonel Tibbetts actually ended up being the pilot of the first B-29 to drop the atomic bomb. However, at the time, he was in charge of recruiting pilots to fly for the B-29 program. And his solution to this problem was, let's hire some female demo pilots because uh, that will show people how safe the plane is since, hey, even girls can fly it, right? So his solution was he decided to hire two pilots by the name of uh, Dorothea Mormon and Dora Daugherty uh, and started to train them to fly the B-29. And he actually trained them within three days, although um, inadequately, I might add, he taught them to uh, ignore all sorts of checks lists and procedures uh, in order to speed up the process. But they did learn how to fly the B-29 and actually within three days started flying people across the country in their B-29s. Uh, however, just a few days later, uh, the Air Force actually put a stop to this PR stunt because the Major General of the Air Force at the time, Barney Gills, actually said that these ladies were, quote, putting the big footballers to shame, unquote, and that if uh, one of the planes actually had an accident uh, that it would be a PR nightmare for them. So only within days of these ladies uh, starting to fly the B-29, they were uh, put back into their previous roles and never flew the plane again. However, this PR stunt did end up being successful because it convinced people that the B-29 was indeed safe to fly because even a girl can fly it. Two steps forward, one step back. Now the B-29 was extremely successful overseas because again, it was at least years ahead of the development of any other aircraft at that time. So it was very successful in conducting high altitude daytime raids at the beginning of the war. And that was because its service ceiling of 34,000 feet actually almost exceeded that of many Japanese fighters as well as most service to air missiles. Uh, so it was also later on during the war very successful at conducting low altitude uh, nighttime raids as well. And that was specifically thanks to its sophisticated remote controlled machine gun turrets, which actually each had a computer that would be able to improve the accuracy of each shot by accounting for the airspeed of the aircraft, the gravity and temperature and humidity, and a lot of other factors that actually uh, greatly improved the accuracy as well as allowed for one crew member to operate multiple guns at the same time. Now, there were many variants made of the B-29 over the years. However, there is one very important variant that we need to talk about, and that is the B-29 Silver Plate. However, the name Silver Plate is probably a little misleading because this variant probably had the least amount of metal uh, than all of the other variants. And that was because it had most of its protective armor as well as most guns removed uh, in order to free up additional weight for a very important and very heavy passenger, the atomic bomb. On August 6, 1945, a B-29 silver plate took off from the Northern Mariana Islands, about a six-hour flight time from Japan. Now, this aircraft, nicknamed Enola Gray, was named after the mother of the pilot in command, again, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, as we mentioned before. Now, this B-29 actually took off with two other B-29s. One was carrying instrumentation and the other was for taking photographs. At 8.18 local time, the very first atomic bomb in the world, nicknamed the Little Boy, was dropped from 31,000 feet and detonated at a distance of 2,000 feet above the city of Hiroshima. Just three days later, on August 9th, the second B-29, nicknamed Boxcar, was piloted by Major Charles Sweeney and took off with the second atomic bomb, nicknamed the Fat Man. So this airplane actually took off for its original destination of the city of Kokura. However, upon flying over the city, uh, the pilots actually found that their sights were obscured by fire and smoke from a B-29 attack just a day prior. So instead, they decided to divert to their secondary target, the city of Nagasaki. 
it's been estimated that the two bombs killed in total uh, anywhere from 130,000 people to 230,000 people, of which 20,000 were soldiers and the rest civilians. So as a result of the attacks, uh, the Japanese government decided to surrender to the Allied forces on August 15th. And on September 2nd, 1945, they signed the Instrument of Surrender in Tokyo, effectively ending World War II. And as for the two planes, Enola Gay and Boxcar, they both lie in museums today around the USA. After World War II, there was no longer such a strong demand for the B-29 bomber aircrafts, and many of them ended up getting uh, sent to the yard or scrapped for parts. Uh, however, there were B-29s that actually fought in the Korean War in the early 50s and went on to conduct uh, rescue missions or photo reconnaissance missions or air-to-air -air refueling, etc. And this just goes to show what a versatile aircraft the B-29 really was. However, by the 60s, uh, most B-29s ended up getting phased out for the more sophisticated bombers like the B-47 Strato Jets or the B-52 Strato Fortresses. So today there are 22 B-29s that lie in museums around the world today and actually two that are still airworthy. And one of them is actually owned by a non-profit company where you can pay to get a ride in one of the 11 crew positions of the B-29. Now talk about an experience of a lifetime. Thanks so much for making it to the end of this episode. I know this one has been a little more on the history side and a little less on the engineering side, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And of course, leave in the comments below any aircrafts you want me to cover in future episodes. I've got some really great aircrafts lined up for you guys. And as always, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future content. And I'll see you guys soon.